Hi, today we are going to talk about basics of closure libraries. We'll discuss how to create them, where to store them, and how to reference from the project. Let's take a look at this diagram. Here's an overview of form and locations of closure libraries. They can be in the form of source code, or they can be packed to the jar files. Inside the jar, you can also store a source code, or uh, it can contain a compiled bytecode. As for locations, libraries can be stored directly on your file system, or they can be put in Git, or in the Maven repo. And Maven repo could be local or remote. Depending on a library form, you can use different locations. On your local file system, you can store a library as a source code or as a jar, or in the GitHub, uh, you can store it as a source code, and in the Maven repo, you could put your jar. Let's create a simple library and try it in all the forms and locations that we've just seen on the diagram. Uh, the most simplistic library form will be a folder with source code. Let's create that folder, we'll call it testlib. And inside testlib, we will have a simple structure. Depth-cdn will contain an empty map. Inside the src folder, we'll have a subfolder called wikajr, which is just my GitHub nickname, and we'll have a file basic mess. In the file basic my CLG, we will define a simple sum function. So I've put my closure source under additional subfolder under SRC, and this is done to ensure that all the namespaces in my library will start from that subfolder name. In this case, this is my nickname, but that could be, for example, your organization name. And by doing this, you ensure that when your library is imported by some project, the namespace name won't clash with any other namespaces that can appear in other libraries or in the project itself. Now we have a super basic library, and to reference it, the simplest way would be to just reference it by location on your file system from other project. So we need to create that project. Let's call it adder. So adder is very simple. There is a depth CDN and there is one source file. I won't create any additional subfolders under SRC because I don't need them. Let's add the code to our core file. What it does, it has one main function that gets the arguments and it references our created library. And what the main does, it takes the arguments from command line, it maps them to convert to integers and then reducing them to get the sum of that arguments and print it to output. If we referenced our library, we now need to specify in depth-cdn how to get that library. Here's the content for our depths.edn. This is the name of a library that we specified, and this its location. When you're referencing local libraries, this name can be anything that you want. This is because when you're referencing real code, you doesn't use that library name, and it doesn't participate in any resolutions and any resolving of folders, namespaces, and so on. But it should be qualified, otherwise you will get an error. More important part is a local root keyword here. Under the hood, depths.edn support the concept called procurer. Procurers are a pieces of functionality that are responsible for fetching and resolving libraries from different places. As you remember, on the diagram we had research places, file system, git, and maven repo, and machinery behind the depths.edn also contains three different procures for fetching libraries from maven, git, and from local file system. And this local slash root is related to local procure. There are other keywords that start from mwn and git, they are respectively to correspond to maven and git procure, and we will see them later. If you are interested to know more about procurers in the Clover CLI, I will put the link in the description and it will point you directly to official website. Also, here we work with devs.edn file. And if you don't really understand well devs.edn, I have a dedicated video on my channel that tells about devs.edn, Clover CLI and all the machinery behind the build process. So you can go ahead and check it. So now we have a library and we have a project that referenced it and we need to run a project to check that library was referenced and resolved correctly. Let's run it from CLI. Uh, we run core namespace with arguments one to three and expect to get the sum of that arguments. Okay, we got it, it is six. 
So our library was resolved correctly. Now let's take a look how we can push the same library to the GitHub and reference it from there. Let's go to the GitHub and create a new repository for our library. We will name it sum lib. Okay, here's instruction on how we can add our existing source code to that repository. Let's go to library directory. Okay, looks like our library is in Git. Let's refresh. Yep, here it is. Now we need to go to the dev.edn of our adder project and change referencing library from the local file system to the git. Uh, before, we will copy the SHA of our commit of that library because we will need it. So now we need to change this. As a name of our library, we will use com github recager and name of the library. And instead of local procurer, we will use the one for git. And to do this, we have a keyword git SHA. Specify the SHA of the commit of the libraries that we want to reference. Note that by contrast with referencing local libraries, here the library name is important because from that name, the correct Git URL for downloading the source code will be deducted. I will leave a link to official documentation that says how exactly this name should be formed to reference your library from different Git providers like Bitbucket, GitLab, GitHub. So our library in GitHub, our devs.edn changed. So we can try again and run tester to check if library was resolved. Yep, we see that library was cloned and our application was run and the output is correct. Also, we can use a text to reference particular library. Let's get back to our lib again. Oh, nope. We will create a tag for version 001 and push it. Now we'll get back to our adder. We will add a git tag here. And in case when we use a git tag, we still need to use the SHA, but we can use a short version of it. Because even when we use tag, we need to make sure that tag wasn't moved to any other commit. Let's run the app again. Nice, everything works. So far we were creating our library as a source code. Now let's try the case with jar. And to use jar, we need to create the jar. We'll do this using the official tools.build library that has a dedicated functions for jar creation. My previous video on this channel was dedicated fully to using tools.build to create the jars. So here I will be very quick on all the steps. And if you need more explanation, please take a look at that video. So to create a jar, first we need to go to depth of our library. It was empty before. Now it will create record like this. Here we add section aliases and create new alias called build. That alias has a dependency of tools.build. By the way, take a look. Here we reference tools.build exactly the way we did it just now with our own library by using tag and SHA. And this option tells us that default namespace to run the functions with build aliases will be build namespace. And we don't have it yet, but we will create it. So let's create build CLG with that namespace. We create it directly at the root of the project. And here I will paste its content. In that build namespace, we reference tools.build API. Next, we have a couple of uh, different helpful devs for library name, for its version, for name of the jar file where we're going to store our library. We have a helper function clean to remove uh, our folder with temporary files. And we have our workhorse, the jar function that actually will create the jar. It references jar function from tools.build library. As I said before, more details about all this are in previous video. And now when we have that build namespace in place, we can run the jar command from it. Let's go to our library back and we will invoke the T option of CLG with our build alias and we'll run the function jar. 
and utter some thinking. We have a target folder in our test lib and we have the jar. Here it's content. It contains our sources. Now we need to get back to editor again and reference the jar instead of git libraries that we had in devs.edm. To reference local jar, we need to use local procurer again. So we are using local slash root keyword here. And as a value to the key, we will put a relative path to our created jar. Here it is. Okay, now we go to our editor. Oh, we're already in that folder and we run it. We have a problem and this is because I duplicated the slip here. Let's save it again and run it again. Ta -da! It again works with new location of our library. Now we have a jar, but referencing it from relative path doesn't look really nice. So we ideally would, la would like to install it to Maven repository. At least for now, while we are developing it, we can not use a remote repository, but we can use a local repository. If you didn't change any default location, most probably your local repository for Maven located in that folder. This one. So how we can install the library here? The answer is with the helper function that provided by tools.build library. And we already use tools.build library within the test lib. So all we need to do is to go to our build namespace and add one more command for installing jar locally. Here's our function. And all it does, it just references the install function from tools.build API. Now we need to invoke that function. We go again to our library directory and we run it. Okay, most probably it's done, but we'd better to check it. Yes, looks like our jar is already in M2 repository. Here's a tree common file output that shows our other files in jar and pom in the folder of 001 of closure sumlib. And as before, when we've changed uh, the location of our library, we need to change the DevCDN for our project that uses it to reference the current version. Let's go to editor. Let's go to its devs.edn. And here we don't need the local root. So now instead of this local root, we need another keyword. We need MVN version that tells us the version of jar files that we need to use. And MVN keyword will tell the machinery behind the devs.edn that we need to use the Maven procure that will handle where exactly the jar should be taken from, from what Maven repository, should it be remote or should it be local one. Let's run our editor again. It works, and that means that we successfully took our library now from jar uh, located in local repository. Perfect. So the very, very last thing that left for us to try is to put our jar into a remote Maven repository. And we are going to put it to the Clojars. And Clojars is a community repository for open source closure libraries, as it says here. To push our jar to local repository, we used a very convenient function in build.clg from tools.build API. But unfortunately, that API doesn't have the same function for remote repository. But tools.build is not the only option. We can use third-party library that do exactly what we need. That helpful third-party library called devs deploy. And we need to add it to our devcdn for library to our build alias. So it will be here. And as you can notice, this library is referenced by MVN version. So it's located in some repository of Maven. Now when dependency is in place, let's go to our build CLG and add the library to required ones. And now we can add a dedicated function for deploy. As you can see, it also calls just function deploy from devs deploy that we just added here. When function invoked, it takes a jar file and pass to pom.xml file and upload them to the cloud jars. And pompass is this helpful function from tools.build that returns pass to your generated pom.xml file. Nice, our code is ready. But before we use it, we need to create our cloud jars 
account. And on that Clodars account, we need to generate token to be able to upload our DAR files. Okay, now we have all our code written, but we need to take a look more carefully at Debs deploy documentation in order to run it. And in the documentation, you can find that to run your deploy command, you need to set up a couple environment variables. And that environment variables are related to CloudJars. You need to go to CloudJars and create your account. And under that account, create a new token. You don't need to use a CloudJars password directly here. You need to generate a token on CloudJars site and put it here. I won't go through all the steps of registering on CloudJars site. It's pretty straightforward. Now, with my Closures login and closures token, I can run the deploy function. Okay, we have a problem here, and the reason is quite obvious. You probably were watching this video all this time and was asking yourself why I don't see that missed keyword. But anyway, here it is. Let's run deploy command again. Perfect. Now it says that our jar is uploaded. Let's check it on the closures itself. Let's open closures. And here is closures some leap. It is uploaded just now. And it doesn't have many helpful descriptions, but that can be added later by you in your pom.xml files. Uh, but now it's important that we already have it in closures. And as a very final step, we would like to run our adder project again to make sure that it is able to take our jar from cloud jars. But to do this, and to be sure that we run the correct jar file, we need to remove that one from our local repository where we installed it just a couple minutes ago. Perfect, now it's removed. And I need to mention that in adder devcdn, we don't need to change this reference of library. We still need to use MVN version uh, with version itself to reference the jar from closures. Okay, let's run the adder. And as we can see, we have an exception that file not found. And the reason is that we didn't change anything in devs.edn. So we have already cached version of our class pass, uh, but we removed the actual jar file that the class pass was uh, related on. So what we need to do is to force recomputation of cached class pass to run again. To do this, we just need to add additional key to Clojure CLI. Perfect, we see that our jar was downloaded from Clojure's and our application successfully ran. That's it. We've covered all the cases depicted on the diagram. Hope this video was helpful for you. And if it was, please like, subscribe, and maybe even share in your social networks. Also, you can consider donations. Half of the donations will go for humanitarian aid for Ukraine, and half of them will be used to make the new videos. See you in the next videos. Bye.